welcome to our parent university session. My name is Kyron Harvell. I am the director of the STAR grant. STAR stands for School Transformation Accelerates Results. We appreciate everyone being here, all parents and stakeholders. We're very fortunate this evening to have Lane School District representatives, Mr. Sean Shaw, who is our student services representative. Also, Pat and Gil, assistant principal, Mr. Calvin Beard. Mr. Shaw will talk about disciplinary matters as well as the state of Michigan seven factors. And Mr. Beard will present on CRPBIS, which stands for culturally responsive positive behavior intervention supports. We will now begin with Mr. Shaw. Thank you again for joining us. Please enter any questions or comments you have in the Q&A session, or you're welcome to enter any questions or comments you have in the chat. Mr. Beard and Mr. Shaw will be happy to answer any questions you have upon completion of their presentation. Mr. Shaw. Good evening, and uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Harville. So this is a topic that uh, is it's not difficult, but it's sometimes a little scary to talk about because it's uh, something that uh, we hope doesn't really happen a lot, but it does happen, human nature, discipline, um, and it happens in the schools and we need to be able to address it effectively. Um, so part of my role is to be an advocate uh, for parents, families, and students in the schools also working with administrators and staff uh, as, as it relates to discipline in the, in the schools. So a lot of times uh, young people can misbehave. We know that. And sometimes it gets to a level where we need to do something a little bit more severe. But before we do that, we want to try all interventions and supports to try to help the student uh, to be better. Um, there was a mandate uh, that came out in Michigan about five years ago in regards to seven factors. We used to be a zero tolerance school. Now we want to do something a little bit different. Um, so with the seven factors, we basically have a process that we use in order for a student to be suspended to student services or expelled or, or expelled, right. So what I'm going to do now is ask Mr. Harvell if there's any questions or kind of run down the seven factors, and I'll respond to those to those questions and those ideas that he has. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. So, Mr. Shaw, first question: is, Are the seven factors? Is this just something Lansing's doing, or is this something statewide? This is statewide. Um, again, I spoke earlier about the zero tolerance, where uh, you could just about do anything. Uh, that relates to discipline and you would get suspended. Um, 10 days, uh, you would have to be suspended in order to come to student services. And that's a lot of time out of the classroom and instruction is important. And so we wanna focus on keeping uh, students in school rather than out, because we know there's a lot of problems that can happen when kids aren't in school. So we address it that way. So again, the supports and interventions that we work with the schools on, try to keep them in school. Thank you. So I'm looking at the seven factors. The first factor is age of the student. Could you tell us a little about that? The age of the student. So we've, it's interesting because we've had students as young as five and six years old come to student services based on the behavior and the discipline that they uh, exhibit in the schools. Um, most of those situations would probably be something more persistent. Uh, situations that where the school is trying to work with the family and the student and they just continue uh, misbehaving. So we have to go to an extreme measure, which that means uh, possibly coming to student services, being suspended for 10 days. Now for high school students, anybody getting suspended is not good, but for high school students, a 10 day suspension um, looks a lot different than an elementary uh, school age kid uh, coming to student services because 10 days is a really long time and it's hard to uh, keep them engaged uh, while they're out. Thank you. The second factor, disciplinary history. Can you tell us a little bit about how that factors into decisions? So what happens is we look at the discipline history to see if there's a pattern um, of behavior or the relevant relevancy of uh, the misconduct if there's a match. Um, we also use uh, the history as data to kind of say, here's what we're looking at and what can we do different. 
um, in order to come to student services, we want to want to exhaust all of our options uh, before uh, they're suspended. That's the last result. We always say that suspension is not an intervention. Uh, so we work through that. So that history kind of tells us what direction we need to go into. If the student comes to student services, then we can be prepared to offer some other solutions or remedies to help out the student and their families. Now, the third factor is disability status. Now, is this a physical disability, a mental, emotional? What does it mean by disability status? So when we talk about disability status, we're talk talking about uh, an IEP, a uh, student that's a labeled as, I don't want to say label, but that uh, has a disability like a special education. Um, that could be like a learning disability. It could be emotional. Um, it could be physical. And so when we look at that, that kind of determines um, if a kid uh, has a disability, we need to know whether or not that disability uh, was part of the behavior. Um, and so so there is a part where uh, special education, uh, their team meets with the principal administrator, um, the teacher in the family to kind of go through what the disability is and if it has a direct relation to the behavior. And if it's found that it is a manifestation of that disability, that is part of that disability, then the school and special ed will work with that student and that family at the school. If it's found that it's not part of the disability, the behavior and the action, then it will be for it could be forwarded over to student services. So we will treat them as a general education student and then we will move forward. Thank you. The first factor is seriousness of behavior. What does that mean as far as the seriousness of the behavior? So in our uh, student handbook, there are three different levels. There's a a, a minimal, a moderate and then like an extreme. It's listed different, but I'm just kind of for the sake of time. Um, and so in those different areas, there are levels of behavior or actions that we say, okay, that was a moderate thing. That's something that we can deal with this way. This one is kind of in the middle. We can deal with that this way. This one is more severe. So we're going to look at this a little bit different than the others. There could be an intervention or a support help but more than likely when it gets to that serious level as it relates to our handbook that's one of those situations where there would be a 10-day suspension more than likely and possibly an expulsion so we just kind of evaluate it that way to to make sure that we're able to connect with the family and the student in the school to give the best intervention thank you the fifth factor is whether behavior posed a safety risk what, is a, what does the land school district consider as a safety risk? Is it, Can you say it again? Whether behavior poses a safety risk. What is considered a safety risk in our district? Is this safety to the student, to the school environment? How is so, it defined? So if the misconduct um, is threatens students and staff, then we're going to look at it in one way because then that, that, that's what we can be uh, a safety hazard. It's uh, interrupting instruction, it's interrupting the, the culture and the climate um, and what we're trying to do in schools. Uh, so we evaluate the safety by if it had an impact, a negative impact on students and staff, and then we will handle that accordingly. And that could be physical, it could be verbal, um, it could be, uh, what I want to say, just uh, persistent conduct with, with negative behavior, um, things like that we'll look at. And if that has an impact on the safety of others in themselves, as well as staff, then that's definitely an area that we need to look into. Thank you. Our sixth factor is whether or not restorative practices can address the behavior. What is a restorative practice? So our restorative practices, practices basically, we like to get all parties involved um, to sit down and have a conversation, basically. Um, but the only thing about restorative, it only works if the person is willing to do it. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times when people are harmed, uh, such as a person being a victim, they don't want to sit in front of uh, the accused uh, and handle that issue. So there's a lot of 
of talking. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of kind of, you know, moderating and, and, and working with families, students, staff to figure out if this is something that we can actually sit down and resolve this problem. I think it's very effective. It's been very effective um, as far as like what data shows. Um, I know a person personally that I work with, Mr. Beard, who is online with us now. Um, he's, he's an excellent person when it comes to restorative. We have this little thing in our department where um, I use him as an example uh, because sometimes, you know, uh, he can get, you know, very frustrated with some of these students. He never gives up on them. And he would call me and we'd have that discussion. And he always goes, I know, I know, I know. And he says, uh, I'll give you a call tomorrow. And that's just for an opportunity for that administrator to take some time, really think about what's going on so they can kind of, you know, come off of that high of being very uh, frustrated and start to think about it in a different way. And more than likely, um, I think maybe one time something happened, but for the most part, when I'm in those situations, we're able to uh, come up with an intervention or some way to help that student and that family um, overcome whatever it is, uh, bring the parties together, have that discussion and move forward and, and, and look uh, for a promising uh, next day. We always like to push the restart burden, uh, button when young people come back, if they are uh, uh, excused from school for a couple of days, uh, but we always want to press that restart button to give them a chance, an equitable chance. So Mr. Shaw, I want to make sure I understand restorative practices. So for example, if there were two students that had a verbal altercation in class that was starting to heighten a little, there would be an opportunity for them to talk with someone and potentially stay in school instead of being suspended? Exactly. So we have uh, our great uh, student support specialists who are in, who are in schools, uh, working in the schools. We also have uh, behavior your interventionists. We also have, um, you know, our assistant principals, if they have them, uh, we have counselors. All these people, if not trained, are very aware of restorative justice and how that works. Um, even like teachers uh, taking a minute to step out in the hall to have the two people uh, have an opportunity to interact. Uh, sometimes principals get involved in that. And they would, hey, have them come down to my office. We have a great public safety staff who's been trained on restorative justice. So it's just that adult uh, grabbing those young people, not necessarily grabbing, but bringing those two together or however many and sitting out, sitting down and having some dialogue about the particular situation and how we can work it out. I think those types of practices and interventions, they help our students as they grow because that's, some, that's a lifelong lesson. Um, mm -hmm. That's something that we all need to be able to do is, is sit across the table uh, and air out differences diplomatic way instead of throwing hands and fists and getting angry and storming out. At some point, you're going to have to monitor uh, that, that temper and bring it down a bit so you can hear the other person and what they're saying and how that made them feel sure. and the impact that it had on them. And once we get to the core of that, a lot of times these issues can be resolved quickly. Uh, in elementary, um, I think it, it works uh, very well because times the young people, by the time you get everybody together, they've forgotten about the problem. They don't even understand or realize what they were angry about. Mm -hmm. um, high school, it's effective because again, it taps into their mental, their social and emotional uh, to get them to start to express themselves in different ways. And if they can learn that, I think that's a key to being successful in life. Thank you. And our last factor of the seven factors, number seven is whether a lesser intervention might address the behavior as an alternative to suspension. Could you give us an example of a lesser intervention, Mr. Shaw? So as I said earlier, that suspension is not intervention. Um, and Dr., well, I'm sorry, Mr. Beard, I'm thinking of his wife. Uh, Mr. Beard will be uh, speaking on our CRPBIS, and I want to kind of plug that in uh, because it basically kind of speaks to expect, expectations in the schools and how things look. Um, so a lot of times when we talk about intervention, we don't want to separate it and narrow it down to one particular thing. An intervention, we have to think out of the box. I know a lot of times, um, I know in our high schools, we talk about community service. 
Um, I was working with uh, Eastern High School at one time, and this is when they were across the street from Sparrow Hospital, and we had a situation. And one of the young people uh, was trespassing on the property. Um, so part of the inter intervention was to have that person do some community service over his hospital. Um, we've had young people clean up the playground. We've had a lot of young people in elementary school as an intervention to uh, do something in the cafeteria or uh, work with another kid and help them out. So it does, it's not limited uh, to say that an intervention has to be like this one thing. We just have to be creative because you never know what can impact a young person and change their behavior and their thought process. This is very interesting, Mr. Shaw. I was unaware that principals went through all of these factors in order to make determination regarding suspensions. Sounds like in Lansing, it was statewide, but more mm -hmm. importantly here in Lansing, there are a lot of fidelity checks and we ensure that students receive a due process, which leads to equitable opportunities because we're not looking at students as a one size fit all, if you would agree with that. What are your thoughts about that, Mr. Shaw? Yes. Well, when we talk about equity, it, it's one of those subjects that um, is really dear to my heart in a sense because we we have a challenge with that that's something that we're learning uh, uh more about you know as a district but when you look at how the makeup of our schools are i think we're like 60 percent uh black and brown students um sometimes there are uh in the staff is kind of uh a look makeup is a little different than that so sometimes we, people are going to school and they're in environments where that's the only time that see that person, you know, and, and they may not see a lot of people that look like them in leadership positions. Um, and so we have to be mindful of that and, and try to figure out what we can do to make people feel comfortable, uh, to make people uh, be aware, may, may not be the right word that I'm trying to think of, but um, to be uh, open to different ways in doing things and, and our normal process. Um, so when I talk about interventions, again, having a connection and building a relationship with someone in the school, a lot of times it may just be that one person. For you in, in particular, uh, when you were over at North, I know that there was a young lady that had uh, several issues, uh, anger problems or whatever. And I know that it was just something as simple as that person uh, coming down to your office and looking at an alternative rather than suspension like, hey, let's sit down and kind of talk about it, uh, regroup, and go back. And that young person was just fine. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. This is very important. And hopefully our parents get understand the message that as administrators in the school district, our ultimate goal is to keep students in school and we need to maximize instructional time. And as you see, there are seven factors that are considered prior to kids even being suspended from school. So hopefully this relieves some anxiety or concerns for parents as it relates to our processes when dealing with discipline for students. And I think that's a, so, look, I'm sorry, Michelle, go ahead, please. No, I just, I just wanted to interject when you, about the seven factors. Um, and this is something that uh, it's important, as you said, that parents know and understand. But I think for our administrators, this is a great tool because it, it, it gets them to, to start to think about what's really happening and looking at creative ways to, to uh, handle discipline in the schools. And I think with having this, it just spells it out. I mean, even on the form, it says, before you even think about uh, suspending a kid uh, for misconduct for 10 days or more, you know, have you considered the following? Um, so it just, it stops them right there to say, hey, mm -hmm. we got to look at this. So that's, that's a big step uh, from the jump anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. That's an excellent transition. On to Patton Gill, Assistant Principal, Mr. Calvin Beard, who will begin his presentation on CRPBIS. And Mr. Beard, you can just tell me next slide. We're ready to move forward. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity um, to speak on a uh, subject that is uh, very dear to me uh, that I've been working with uh, the last four to five or six years uh, very intentionally, and that is CRPBIS. And um, I know um, Mr. Harvell uh, kind of gave the uh, what CRPBIS is and uh, what I'm going to do as I walk through this, uh, these few slides that I put together is kind of give you some definitions and then give you some understanding on how 
uh, you as the parent can get involved in our um, CRPBIS process. Um, the PBIS uh, piece is the positive behavior interventions and supports. Uh, the definition states, as you see on the um, screen, is as it's an architecture of addressing behavior through the prevention oriented structuring of research based interventions and supports. This structure is used for the purpose of improving behavioral and academic outcomes. Um, in practice, this generally appears as three tiers of uh, individualized behavior interventions and supports, uh, which you may have heard is uh, MTSS, multi-tier systems of support, as well as a system of data collection analysis. Um, CR, uh, the PBIS is the, 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 the meat of what uh, we want to create when we talk about having a positive culture and climate inside of the school building with our students, staff, and faculty. Go ahead to the next staff, uh, side, please. Uh, culturally responsive. Um, this, people look at and dictate culture responsiveness in different ways, but the definition uh, that I have here is it states that the ability to learn from and relate uh, respectfully with people of your own culture as well as those from other cultures. Uh, one of the most effective ways to bring cultural responsi uh, responsiveness into the school environment is to train our teachers and staff to be prepared for a diverse classroom uh, and diverse families. And when we talk about diverse classrooms and families, we're talking about our student population, our families that we um, educate and we service every day and we have one of the biggest diverse uh, communities in uh, schools in the state of Michigan. So um, this is why being culturally responsive for us as staff and our district is so important and why we need you to be part of that. Uh, the way we all receive information and process information is usually culturally based, which means how we were taught when we were growing up uh, by our parents, grandparents, uh, family members, friends, and so forth. Uh, the information that we've received has been taught to us and, and, and all of us have learned differently. So we have to be able to identify and respect and understand each and every one of each other's um, uh, process. Okay, you can go to the next. Um, there are certain principles of uh, culturally responsive teaching um, and I'm just going to ba touch bases on just a few of those. Um, and it's affirming students and their cultural connections, which means we want to make sure that students are connecting to the, what we're our content of edu the, that we're delivering, uh, the math, the science, the English, social studies, and whatever other subjects that we are uh, delivering or preparing for your student. We want to make sure that we are also affirming their cultural connections to those uh, different topics and subjects. Uh, being personally inviting uh, means that we are open and our arms are open and we're welcoming everyone into our schools and to our community and saying you belong here, you can, there's a place for you here and that's very important. Uh, reinforcing students in their own academic development which means we're pushing your student to be successful. Uh, one thing I always tell our students is there's an expectation of excellence. Um, and that, and I always tell students, even in my announcements or when I'm talking to them personally, I want you to strive for excellence. Excellence is where we need to be. And so I th I'm a firm believer that, you know, every student can learn. It's just a matter of how we push that student to learn or give them the tools to be able to increase their learning. Um, creating physically and culturally inviting learning environments, which means when your student comes into our building or into the classroom, they can identify with something that resonates with them, right? Uh, because all this, we want to make sure that every bit of our, uh, every square foot of our buildings and facilities in our schools is very welcoming and, and has the uh, diversity piece where everybody can feel comfortable. And if it's not there, we need to be able to make the adjustment to make sure that we are giving our students the opportunities in, 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 in those environments. Accommodating our instruction to the cultural and learning differences of our students, which means that there's, again, we heard uh, when we, they were, uh, Mr. Shaw and we're talking, there's no one way to do a lot of the things that we're doing when it comes to education. Education is so 
diverse and it's so well-rounded. There's so much to it that there's no one way to teach every student, right? We, we deliver our content, but each kid learns differently. I know myself, I was a hands-on learner. And so I learned a lot by touching and moving things in pieces. And so um, we are in, intentionally accommodating, trying to accommodate and going to do better at accommodating instruction in, in the cultural learning differences of our students. You can go to the next slide. What is the goal of our uh, culturally responsive teaching? A primary goal of culturally responsive teaching is to ensure that all students from diverse backgrounds have meaningful opportunities to experience quality instruction that consistently incorporates cultural components to support learning. Parents, this is where we need you, and this is where we need your help. Um, and there are six types of parent involvement. Now, and I have a few here. Uh, one is parenting. Not that we're not challenging any parenting skills. We're saying that we need you to work with us so we can work with you so we want to make your child, your student better. And so the things that you do at home that may can help us in our building and the things that we do with your student in our buildings that may help you at home. And that's why we need to have that collaborative partnership with one another to be able to make sure that every student is successful in our buildings. Communicating is one of the biggest, biggest pieces of this uh, whole process. I must be able to speak with you. You must be able to speak with us. And we must be all be, uh, be able to sit down and come up with what's best for the student with the student's voice included. Because there's no reason to have a meeting without the student because we need to hear from our students as well. Volunteering, we're asking that you volunteer in our buildings, the, uh, the buildings that your students uh, attend. Uh, we have so many activities and, and, and programs that are going on in our district and we, we don't have enough hands. And so we really, really, really are petitioning your volunteering to help us conduct and get a lot of the things that we really want to do for your children uh, accomplished. And we need your help to do that. Learning at home. This is one of the biggest pieces. That's why I have it in red because right now we're learning online. And so this is an opportunity as a parent or a guardian or a brother or sister or whatever to really engage with your student to help and see what their educational process is and where they're at educationally so you will have an understanding of what the teachers are doing and that way you can know what's best, uh, how best to support your child and you're an advocate for your child. So if you see something that's going on with your child's learning or anything of that nature, then uh, by speaking to us and having that conversation, dialogue with us, that we may put some things together that can help move your, your child, daughter, son, or along so we can make sure that they're having success in the uh, classroom. Uh, decision making uh, speaks for itself. We uh, have to make positive decisions for our students and children because they uh, emulate what they see us do, right, as adults. Um, I spoke earlier today in one of our sessions when uh, adults always don't seem to think we should be able to apologize to children when we make a mistake. And that's the biggest misconception because if the children never hear us apologize, they will, they will have a hard time apologizing for anything that they've done wrong to others. So we have to practice very great decision making amongst us and collaborating with the community. Our biggest thing is we're really big on collaborating with our community. We need our community. Uh, we, we can't be successful in our district without our community. We need every community partner. We need every parent, everybody that's out here in Lansing that will help us to make sure that every student in our district is prepared for what life has to offer them when they step outside of our doors into this world. Um, one with CRPBIS with the culture and climate is uh, positive um, feedback from the teachers when students are doing well, uh, praises, uh, uh, rewards in schools as far as like earning things, um, different things of that nature. I'm real big on making sure kids get everything. Like you can earn this. I got this prize. What do you want to do for this? Um, that's one of my things. I love being competitive because um, it brings out something about our children that is really um, unique about each and every one of them. So we have, um, we're doing what we can to make sure that our culture and climate is the best. And 
when we have an ideal perfect or maybe not as perfect culture and climate when it's working for us and we have positive things going on it decreases a child's uh interaction to negative behavior and it decreases the number or the amount of students that would have to go see Mr. Shaw um, in, that, in that process, okay? So when we have positive things going on, students are thinking positive about their building, speaking positively about their, their school building and, and, and having ownership within their school building. Think, uh, students begin to regulate themselves and hold each other accountable in positive ways and then you will start to see even more success in our buildings around our district. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We have a question. Uh, Mrs. Diller, I'm going to click the allow to talk button so that we can hear your question. I saw your hand raised. So Ms. Diller, you're welcome to speak. Ms. Diller? Okay, maybe she stepped away. She'll come back to her question. She saw her hand raised in the chat. We have someone else. We actually, actually, we're very fortunate. We have a few Lane School District principals here, and I'm curious on their thoughts as it relates to culture responsive practices. So I'm going to start with Dr. Nicole Beard. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to click the allow to talk button. If you wouldn't mind sharing how things are going at Riddle in terms of what you're doing to ensure CRPBIS is in place and that, as Mr. Beard mentioned, families and communities are involved. Dr. Beard. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I would concur with Mr. Shaw and Mr. Beard. I think the practices that the Lansing District School District has put in place um, are going to help us to reduce the amount of suspensions. I really like the restorative practices and restorative justice that we practice here. Um, I'm working, working really hard with our school to continue to grow in our culture and climate. We've come a long way and um, every year we're looking at ways that we can do better. So um, we have that community mindset as well. I like to um, reflect on the times that I've called the Office of School Culture and I have spoken with Mr. Shaw and others and just having that thought partner when you're at that point where you just are out of options and you think that you might have to go down that road of suspension they're that safe place that you can go to and, and, and they'll say, wait a minute, you know, Mr. Shaw will say, it's that one sentence that he says and that lets you know, okay, he's talking me off the ledge, so to speak. And then it helps you to stop and think, okay, there are more things that I can do because if they're not at school, we can't teach them. Mm -hmm. So I am, am really um, encouraging anyone in the district, if you don't know about these processes and have not invested, I really encourage you to do that because it goes a long way to improve the culture and climate of the school, as well as build relationships with the parents and um, their students. Thank you very much, Dr. Beard. Thank you. Ms. Arosha is the principal at Pattengale. She works with Mr. Beard as principals at Pattengale. Ms. Arosha will find sharing the importance of CRPBIS, as well as the seven factors as it relates to building community and being culture responsive. Absolutely. Um, good evening. Great job, evening. gentlemen, in your presentations. I just want to add also um, that Pat and Gail, Mr. Beard, has helped to lead our CRPBIS committee, where our committee is very dedicated in meeting more than monthly in the beginning of the school year, especially forming the team, making sure that it was um, equitable across the grades and uh, academic groups making sure that we have parent representation and we're looking at ways of how we can incorporate our students in here as well. Uh, the team has put together a survey that we sent out to parents asking family opinions about what their feelings are and being really reflective of what things are like at home for families. And we're incorporating family opinions into our policies and processes as a part of the CRPBIS team. As it relates to the seven factors, in a best case scenario, we would never need the seven factors because we would have all perfect relationships with our students where we understand their needs and we can meet all of those needs. Unfortunately, there are some times that we need to, like the gentleman mentioned, have a little extra support and 
refer kids to student services. The seven factors help us look at, are, are we being equitable? Is this student potentially seeing, uh, facing a dis suspension um, because of a disability or because of the age? Is this, is this consequence or this disciplinary action equitable for their age or, or any of the factors? So it's, it's a very good, thoughtful uh, process for administration to go through. Thank you very much, Ms. Rocha. Next, we have Dr. Sarah O'Neill, who is our Curriculum and Equity Gap Specialist for Lane School District. Dr. O'Neill, I'm curious to hear from you what types of professional development the Lane School District has in place for our teachers who may need support in terms of culturally responsive practices. As we are aware, in terms of our student demographic, 39% of our students are African American, 24% are Caucasian, 19% are Latino, 10% are two or more races, the other eight to, to Six to eight percent is Asian, Pacific Islander, et cetera. However, our teacher demographic is 90 percent Caucasian females. So I'm wondering from your perspective, what direction are you taking to provide professional development opportunities to ensure all staff are culturally competent? Absolutely. Uh, it starts at the top. So as a family, our administrators are deeply immersed around issues of equity and they have intensive training ongoing training of how to have these tough conversations around discipline. So I would empower parents, uh, if, if they're feeling feelings of prejudice or bias, or even, you know, feel like they need to use the term race, I would encourage you to sit down and do it because our principals uh, can handle it. They also will advocate for you to sit down with a teacher and you as a parent to navigate these conversations. As far as the curriculum, we're working intensively on trying to adapt our curriculum to include more voice from our students to help them gain leadership skills and quite honestly, take a look at what we're teaching and what we're not teaching. So district-wide, we're very invested in the work. It's a process. It's not overnight, um, but, but we we need your voices as well. So any feedback you have, it is welcomed. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Neill. Ms. Dillard, wanted to see if you were back, wanted to give you the opportunity to ask your question because you were the first to have your hand raised. Ms. Dillard, are you here? Ms. Dillard? Okay, no problem. Maybe Ms. Dillard stepped away. Uh, gentlemen, question for you. What types of professional development sessions have we had for staff? Currently, what's currently going on as far as initiatives? What are we seeing as far as professional development to ensure that we are culture competent? What are you guys seeing? Uh, Mr. Shaw, why don't you start, followed by Mr. Beard. Um, this year, I'm not sure if we've had any, I, I, I don't know, I can't answer that question um, okay. because of how things have been going this year. We're not face to face. Um, I'm not currently involved in a lot of the administrative uh, where I think administrators they meet every Tuesday or whatever um, so I can't I can't answer the question I know that we are uh, working on several things but how that's going to be rolled out um, I can't speak to that no problem Mr. Beer what have you seen or what are we currently doing for administrative level in terms of professional development opportunities whether that's speakers whether that's trainings what are, what are we doing here in Lansing so our parents are aware that we are taking cultural responsiveness, very serious? Um, so far this year, we've had um, several uh, professional development opportunities um, uh, offered to our staff and uh, through, your, uh, through the STAR grant, um, as well as far as um, the equity, uh, teaching of equity, the um, uh, different um, identifiers of, you know, implicit biases and what, um, what that looks like and how we uh, deal with uh, what's going on. There's uh, opportunities in our uh, unified talent system uh, that it, the district offers through um, ISD, Ingham ISD. Um, and so there are so many opportunities for our staff to take advantage of their, um, these professional developments um, uh, now that they do them on like Wednesdays, um, on our A days, uh, they have an opportunity to go to different um, uh, trainings that are being offered throughout our district. And then we have our district, um, whole district 
uh, professional developments where uh, our executive teams and directors are bringing in um, speakers and trainers that are uh, speaking to us about these different topics and um, just making us aware and getting us uh, thinking and, um, and, and, and how to process and prepare ourselves uh, for uh, such a time that we're, we're in right now. And so um, for all the parents to under, know that we are um, making sure that we as a staff, as a faculty here in the Lansing School District are putting our best foot forward to make sure that we can provide your students and you with the best possible education and experience that we can give you in, uh, in our community. Um, I would also say to our parents that um, I encourage you to reach out to your school, uh, your administrator, to see who is in heading their CRPBIS team and uh, ask, can you be involved? Um, we at Pattengale have already begun to see um, an increase of participation from our parents in our CRPBIS meetings. Good. Good. Um, we, we want to hear your voice. Uh, we want you to have a voice in our positive culture and climate um, because, you know, we're educators, right? And we, we know education. So there are times where we're not going to see or know everything that could possibly be great for our students. And you all have some great ideas um, and we would love to hear them and have you involved in that process. Again, it's a community collaboration between us, your student and you. And we really need you and we need your voice to be uh, to make us even more effective. Excellent. Excellent. We have a comment from Dr. Beard. The Star Grant and CRPBIS facilitators work directly with schools to examine current practices and develop plans to continue culturally responsive practices. Thank you very much for that comment, Dr. Beard. Again, I'd like to thank both of you gentlemen for this wonderful presentation tonight. This was definitely needed. I'm glad we could provide parents with information on how we are rolling out plans for our students. And we want parents to realize that we see students in our district as a family. We're here to support students. Our ultimate goal is to keep students here in school with us and to maximize instructional time, maximize time for social emotional learning, maximize opportunities for mental health support. Thank you very much, Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Mr. Beard. Thank you for our participants. Everyone, thank you very much for participating in this session of Parent University. Everyone, please have a great night. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you. Thank you. See you.